Section 4 of Fantasy Fairies and Ghosts by Various. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Cross Purposes, Chapter 4. When he woke, he found himself still afloat upon the broad palm leaf. He was alone in the middle of a lake, with flowers and trees growing in and out of it everywhere. The sun was just over the treetops. A drip of water from the flowers greeted him with music. The mists were dissolving away, and where the sunlight fell on the lake, the water was clear as glass. Casting his eyes downward, he saw, just beneath him, far down at the bottom, Alice drowned, as he thought. He was in the act of plunging in when he saw her eyes open, and at the same moment begin to float up. He held out his hand, but she repelled it with disdain, and swimming to a tree sat down on a low branch, wondering how ever the poor widow's son could have found his way into fairyland. She did not like it. It was an invasion of privilege. "'How did you come here, young Richard?' she asked from six yards off. "'A goblin brought me.' "'Ah, I thought so. A fairy brought me.' Where is your fairy? Here I am, said Peas Blossom, rising slowly to the surface, just by the tree on which Alice was seated. Where is your goblin? retorted Alice. Here I am, bald toadstool, rushing out of the water like a salmon, and casting a somersault in the air before he fell in again with a tremendous splash. His head rose again close beside Peas Blossom, who, being used to such creatures, only laughed. "'Isn't he handsome?' he grinned. "'Yes, very. He wants polishing, though. You could do that for yourself, you know. Shall we change?' "'I don't mind. You'll find her rather silly.' "'That's nothing. The boy's too sensible for me.' He dived and rose at Alice's feet. She shrieked with terror. The fairy floated away like a water-lily towards Richard. What a lovely creature, thought he. But hearing Alice shriek again, he said, Don't leave Alice. She's frightened at that queer creature. I don't think there's any harm in him, though, Alice. Oh, no, he won't hurt her, said Peace Blossom. I'm tired of her. He's going to take her to the court, and I will take you. I don't want to go. But you must. You can't go home again. You don't know the way. Richard, Richard, cried Alice in an agony. Richard sprang from his boat and was by her side in a moment. He pinched me, cried Alice. Richard hit the goblin a terrible blow on the head, but it took no more effect upon him than if his head had been a round ball of India rubber. He gave Richard a furious look, however, and bawling out, You'll repent that dick, vanished under the water. Come along, Richard, make haste. He will murder you, cried the fairy. It's all your fault, said Richard. I won't leave Alice. Then the fairy saw it was all over with her and Toadstool, for they can do nothing with mortals against their will. So she floated away across the water in Richard's boat, holding her robe for a sail, and vanished, leaving the two alone in the lake. "'You have driven away my fairy,' cried Alice. "'I shall never get home now. It is all your fault, you naughty young man.' "'I drove away the goblin,' remonstrated Richard. "'Will you please to sit on the other side of the tree? I wonder what my papa would say if he saw me talking to you.' "'Will you come to the next tree, Alice?' said Richard, after a pause. Alice, who had been crying all the time that Richard was thinking, said, "'I won't.' Richard, therefore, plunged into the water without her and swam for the tree. Before he had got halfway, however, he heard Alice crying, "'Richard! Richard!' This was just what he wanted. So he turned back and Alice threw herself into the water. With Richard's help she swam pretty well, and they reached the tree. Now for the next, said Richard, and they swam to the next, and then to the third. 
every tree they reached was larger than the last, and every tree before them was larger still. So they swam from tree to tree, till they came to one that was so large that they could not see round it. What was to be done? Clearly to climb this tree. It was a dreadful prospect for Alice, but Richard proceeded to climb, and by putting her feet where he put his, and now and then getting hold of his ankle, she managed to make her way up. There were a great many stumps where branches had withered off, and the bark was nearly as rough as a hillside, so there was plenty of foothold for them. When they had climbed a long time, and were getting very tired indeed, Alice cried out, "'Richard, I shall drop, I shall. Why did you come this way?' and she began once more to cry. But at that moment Richard caught hold of a branch above his head, and reaching down his other hand, got hold of Alice, and held her till she had recovered a little. In a few moments more they reached the fork of the tree, and there they sat and rested. "'This is capital,' said Richard cheerily. "'What is?' asked Alice sulkily. Why, we have room to rest, and there's no hurry for a minute or two. I'm tired. You selfish creature, said Alice. If you are tired, what must I be? Tired too, answered Richard. But we've got on bravely, and look, what's that? By this time the day was gone, and the night so near, that in the shadows of the tree all was dusky and dim but there was still light enough to discover that in a niche of the tree sat a huge horned owl with green spectacles on his beak and a book in one foot. He took no heed of the intruders, but kept muttering to himself, and what do you think the owl was saying? I will tell you. He was talking about the book that he held upside down in his foot. Stupid book this! Nothing in it at all, everything upside down. Stupid ass! Says owls can't read, I can read backwards. I think that is the goblin again, said Richard in a whisper. However, if you ask a plain question, he must give you a plain answer, for they are not allowed to tell downright lies in fairyland. Don't ask him, Richard. You know you gave him a dreadful blow. I gave him what he deserved, and he owes me the same. Hello! Which is the way out? He wouldn't say, if you please, because then it would not have been a plain question. Downstairs, hissed the owl, without ever lifting his eyes from the book, which all the time he read upside down, so learned was he. "'On your honour as a respectable old owl?' asked Richard. "'No,' hissed the owl, and Richard was almost sure that he was not really an owl. So he stood staring at him for a few moments, when all at once, without lifting his eyes from the book, the owl said, "'I will sing a song,' and began. "'Nobody knows the world but me. When they're all in bed, I sit up to see.' I'm a better student than students all, for I never read till the darkness fall, and I never read without my glasses, and that is how my wisdom passes. Howl, owl, wool, hool, wool, wool. I can see the wind. Now who can do that? I see the dreams that he has in his hat. I see him snorting them out as he goes out at his stupid old trumpet nose. Ten thousand things that you couldn't think, I write them down with pen and ink. Howl, owl, hoo, loo, wit, tit, tit, that's wit. You may call it learning, tis mother wit. No one else sees the lady moon sit on the sea, her nest all night but the owl, hatching the boats and the long-legged fowl. When the oysters gape to sing by rote, she crams a pearl down each stupid throat. Howl, owl, wit, it, that's wit, there's a fowl. 
and so singing he threw the book in Richard's face, spread out his great silent soft wings, and sped away into the depths of the tree. When the book struck Richard, he found that it was only a lump of wet moss. While talking to the owl, he had spied a hollow behind one of the branches. Judging this to be the way the owl meant, he went to see, and found a rude, ill-defined staircase going down into the very heart of the trunk. But so large was the tree that this could not have hurt it in the least. Down this stair, then, Richard scrambled as best he could, followed by Alice, not of her own will. She gave him clearly to understand, but because she could do no better. Down, down they went, slipping and falling sometimes, but never very far, because the stair went round and round. It caught Richard when he slipped, and he caught Alice when she did. They had begun to fear that there was no end to the stair. It went round and round so steadily, when creeping through a crack, they found themselves in a great hall, supported by thousands of pillars of grey stone. Where the little light came from they could not tell. This hall they began to cross in a straight line, hoping to reach one side, and intending to walk along it till they came to some opening. They kept straight by going from pillar to pillar, as they had done before by the trees. Any honest plan will do in fairyland if you only stick to it, and no plan will do if you do not stick to it. It was very silent, and Alice disliked the silence more than the dimness, so much indeed that she longed to hear Richard's voice. But she had always been so cross to him when he had spoken that he thought it better to let her speak first, and she was too proud to do that. She would not even let him walk alongside of her, but always went slower when he wanted to wait for her, so that at last he strode on alone. And Alice followed. But by degrees the horror of silence grew upon her, and she felt at last as if there were no one in the universe but herself. The hall went on widening around her. Their footsteps made no noise. The silence grew so intense that it seemed on the point of taking shape. At last she could bear it no longer. She ran after Richard, got up with him and laid hold of his arm. He had been thinking for some time what an obstinate, disagreeable girl Alice was, and wishing he had her safe home to be rid of her, when feeling a hand and looking round, he saw that it was the disagreeable girl. She soon began to be companionable after a fashion, for she began to think, putting everything together, that Richard must have been several times in Fairyland before now. It is very strange, she said to herself, for he is quite a poor boy. I am sure of that. His arms stick out beyond his jacket like the ribs of his mother's umbrella. And to think of me wandering about Fairyland with him. The moment she touched his arm, they saw an arch of blackness before them. They had walked straight to a door. Not a very inviting one, for it opened upon an utterly dark passage. Where there was only one door, however, there was no difficulty about choosing. Richard walked straight through it, and from the greater fear of being left behind, Alice faced the lesser fear of going on. In a moment they were in total darkness. Alice clung to Richard's arm and murmured almost against her will, Dear Richard! It was strange that fear should speak like love, but it was in fairyland. It was strange, too, that as soon as she spoke thus, Richard should fall in love with her all at once. But what was more curious still was that, at the same moment, Richard saw her face. In spite of her fear, which had made her pale, she looked very lovely. Dear Alice, said Richard, how pale you look. How can you tell that, Richard, when all is as black as pitch? 
I can see your face. It gives out light. Now I see your hands. Now I can see your feet. Yes, I can see every spot where you are going to. No, don't put your foot there. There is an ugly toad just there. The fact was that the moment he began to love Alice, his eyes began to send forth light. What he thought came from Alice's face really came from his eyes. All about her and her path he could see, and every minute saw better. But to his own path he was blind. He could not see his hand when he held it straight before his face, so dark was it. But he could see Alice, and that was better than seeing the way, ever so much. At length, Alice, too, began to see a face dawning through the darkness. It was Richard's face, but it was far handsomer than when she saw it last. Her eyes had begun to give light, too, and she said to herself, Can it be that I love the poor widow's son? I suppose that must be it, she answered herself with a smile, for she was not disgusted with herself at all. Richard saw the smile and was glad. Her paleness had gone, and a sweet rosiness had taken its place, and now she saw Richard's path as he saw hers, and between the two sights they got on well. They were now walking on a path betwixt two deep waters which never moved, shining as black as ebony where the eyelight fell. But they saw ere long that this path kept growing narrower and narrower. At last, to Alice's dismay, the black waters met in front of them. What is to be done now, Richard? she said. When they fixed their eyes on the water before them, they saw that it was swarming with lizards and frogs and black snakes and all kinds of strange and ugly creatures especially some that had neither heads nor tails, nor legs nor fins nor feelers, being, in fact, only living lumps. These kept jumping out and in and sprawling upon the path. Richard thought for a few moments before replying to Alice's question, as indeed well he might. But he came to the conclusion that the path could not have gone on for the sake of stopping there, and that it must be a kind of finger that pointed on where it was not allowed to go itself. So he caught up Alice in his strong arms and jumped into the middle of the horrid swarm. And just as minnows vanish if you throw anything amongst them, just so these wretched creatures vanished, right and left and every way. He found the water broader than he had expected, and before he got over, he found Alice heavier than he could have believed. But upon a firm, rocky bottom, Richard waded through in safety. When he reached the other side, he found that the bank was a lofty, smooth, perpendicular rock, with some rough steps cut in it. By and by the steps led them right into the rock, and they were in a narrow passage once more, but this time leading up. It wound round and round like the thread of a great screw. At last Richard knocked his head against something and could go no further. The place was close and hot. He put up his hands and pushed what felt like a warm stone. It moved a little. Go down, you brutes, growled a voice above, quivering with anger. You'll upset my pot and my cat and my temper too if you push that way. Go down. Richard knocked very gently and said, Please let us out. Oh, yes, I dare say, very fine and soft-spoken. Go down, you goblin brutes. I've had enough of you. I'll scald the hair off your ugly heads. If you do that again, go down, I say. Seeing fair speech was of no avail, Richard told Alice to go down a little, out of the way, and setting his shoulders to one end of the stone, heaved it up. Whereupon down came the other end, with a pot and a fire, and a cat which had been asleep beside it. She frightened Alice dreadfully as she rushed past her, showing nothing but her green lamping eyes. 
Richard, peeping up, found that he had turned a hearthstone upside down. On the edge of the hole stood a little crooked old man, brandishing a mop-stick in a tremendous rage, and hesitating only where to strike him. But Richard put him out of his difficulty by springing up and taking the stick from him. Then, having lifted Alice out, he returned it with a bow, and heedless of the maledictions of the old man, proceeded to get the stone and the pot up again. For Puss, she got out herself. Then the old man became a little more friendly and said, I beg your pardon, I thought you were goblins. They never will let me alone, but you must allow it was rather an unusual way of paying a morning call and the creature bowed conciliatingly. "'It was indeed,' answered Richard. "'I wish you had turned the door to us instead of the hearthstone.' For he did not trust the old man. "'But,' he added, "'I hope you will forgive us.' "'Oh, certainly, certainly, my dear young people. Use your freedom. But such young people have no business to be out alone. It is against the rules.' "'But what is one to do?' I mean two to do when they can't help it. Yes, yes, of course, but now you know, I must take charge of you. So you sit there, young gentleman, and you sit there, young lady. He put a chair for one at one side of the hearth, and for the other at the other side, and then drew his chair between them. The cat got upon his hump and then set up her own. So here was a wall that would let through no moonshine. But although both Richard and Alice were very much amused, they did not like to be parted in this peremptory manner. Still, they thought it better not to anger the old man any more, in his own house, too. But he had been once angered, and that was once too often, for he had made it a rule never to forgive without taking it out in humiliation. It was so disagreeable to have him sitting there between them that they felt as if they were far asunder. In order to get the better of the fancy, they wanted to hold each other's hand behind the dwarf's back. But the moment their hands began to approach, the back of the cat began to grow long and its hump to grow high. And in a moment more, Richard found himself crawling wearily up a steep hill, whose ridge rose against the stars while a cold wind blew drearily over it. Not a habitation was in sight, and Alice had vanished from his eyes. He felt, however, that she must be somewhere on the other side, and so climbed and climbed to get over the brow of the hill, and down to where he thought she must be. But the longer he climbed, the farther off the top of the hill seemed, till at last he sank, quite exhausted, and must I confess it? Very nearly began to cry. To think of being separated from Alice all at once, and in such a disagreeable way. But he fell a-thinking instead, and soon said to himself, This must be some trick of that wretched old man. Either this mountain is a cat, or it is not. If it is a mountain, this won't hurt it. If it is a cat... I hope it will. With that, he pulled out his pocket knife and feeling for a soft place, drove it at one blow up to the handle in the side of the mountain. A terrific shriek was the first result and the second that Alice and he sat looking at each other across the old man's hump from which the catamountain had vanished. Their host sat staring at the blank fireplace without ever turning round, pretending to know nothing of what had taken place. "'Come along, Alice,' said Richard, rising. "'This won't do. We won't stop here.' Alice rose at once and put her hand in his. They walked towards the door. The old man took no notice of them. The moon was shining brightly through the window, but instead of stepping out into the moonlight when they opened the door, they stepped into a great, beautiful hall, through the high Gothic windows of which 
the same moon was shining. Out of this hall they could find no way, except by a staircase of stone which led upwards. They ascended it together. At the top Alice let go Richard's hand to peep into a little room, which looked all the colours of the rainbow, just like the inside of a diamond. Richard went a step or two along a corridor, but finding she had left him, turned and looked into the chamber. He could see her nowhere. The room was full of doors, and she must have mistaken the door. He heard her voice calling him, and hurried in direction of the sound, but he could see nothing of her. More tricks, he said to himself. It is of no use to stab this one. I must wait till I see what can be done. Still he heard Alice calling him, and still he followed, as well as he could. At length he came to a doorway, open to the air, through which the moonlight fell. But when he reached it, he found that it was high up in the side of a tower, the wall of which went straight down from his feet, without stair or descent of any kind. Again he heard Alice call him, and lifting his eyes saw her across a wide castle court, standing at another door just like the one he was at, with the moon shining full upon her. All right, Alice, he cried. Can you hear me? Yes, answered she. Then listen, this is all a trick. It is all a lie of that old wretch in the kitchen. Just reach out your hand, Alice, dear. Alice did as Richard asked her, and although they saw each other many yards off across the court, their hands met. There, I thought so, exclaimed Richard triumphantly. Now, Alice, I don't believe it is more than a foot or two down to the court below, though it looks like a hundred feet. Keep fast hold of my hand and jump when I count three. But Alice drew her hand from him in sudden dismay, whereupon Richard said, Well, I will try first, and jumped. The same moment his cheery laugh came to Alice's ears, and she saw him standing safe on the ground far below. Jump, dear Alice, and I will catch you, said he. I can't. I am afraid, answered she. The old man is somewhere near you. You had better jump, said Richard. Alice sprang from the wall in terror, and only fell a foot or two into Richard's arms. The moment she touched the ground, they found themselves outside the door of a little cottage, which they knew very well. For it was only just within the wood that bordered on their village. Hand in hand they ran home as fast as they could. When they reached a little gate that led into her father's grounds, Richard bade Alice good-bye. The tears came in her eyes. Richard and she seemed to have grown quite man and woman in fairyland, and they did not want to part now. But they felt that they must. So Alice ran in the back way and reached her own room before anyone had missed her. Indeed, the last of the red had not quite faded from the west. As Richard crossed the market-place on his way home, he saw an umbrella man just selling the last of his umbrellas. He thought the man gave him a queer look as he passed, and felt very much inclined to punch his head. But remembering how useless it had been to punch the goblin's head, he thought it better not. In reward of their courage, the fairy queen sent them permission to visit fairyland as often as they pleased and no goblin or fairy was allowed to interfere with them. For Peas Blossom and Toadstool, they were both banished from court, and compelled to live together for seven years, in an old tree that had just one green leaf upon it. Toadstool did not mind it much, but Peas Blossom did. End of section four. End of cross-purposes.